Hey, Red Clay Rambler fans, it's been a wild year, and I want to thank you for spending your time with me, listening to world-class artists speak about their lives and creativity. It's an honor to do this work, and I appreciate you choosing to listen week in and week out. As we wrap up 2020, I need your help funding future episodes. I'm not on a major network like NPR or Gimlet Media. I'm a one-man operation, and I depend on the support of my listeners to keep the show going. I know this year has been tough for a lot of folks, so for our fall fund drive, I'm keeping my request simple. I ask that if you're able, you commit $4 a month to the show. That's only a dollar an episode to keep you inspired and connected to the greater ceramic community. I've got big plans for 2021, and your support now can help make those plans a reality. There are two easy ways to donate. One through the PayPal portal at talesoverredclayrambler.com slash donate, or you can make a monthly pledge at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. If you join Patreon today, you can access perks like t-shirts, water bottles, and other podcast swag, as well as having access to the Patreon-exclusive Tales from the Vault podcast, which features remastered episodes that are no longer available on major podcast apps. As always, thanks for listening, stay safe out there, and let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 352 of the podcast. Today on the show, I talk with Marty Gross about the Minge Film Archive. This is a decades-long project that started in 1975 when he visited Bernard Leach in St. Ives. In this interview, we talk about his methods for digitizing the old reel-to-reel films, understanding the impact of D.T. Suzuki on Sayetsu Yanagi, who was the main philosopher of the Minge group, and then also how these videos reshape the way we think about Soji Hamada and other Minge leaders. If you'd like to see examples of these films, you can do so by googling Minge Film Archive. There's also clips on YouTube, so you can also check those out there. Before we get to that interview, I wanted to thank the folks that have been shopping my holiday sale. If you would like to do some last-minute shopping, there's still pots left and time to ship them. So check that out at carterpottery.com slash shop. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about how you approach filmmaking, because you're often using other clips or clips from the past and then putting those together in a way that talks to people in the present. So can you talk about your approach to uh, filmmaking? Well, uh, I I have made other documentaries, which are uh, in a certain way more uh, conventional in the sense that they were made from scratch. Uh, I took, I made a film about the work that I do with children in my studio many years ago. I made a film, Potters at Work, uh, which you may know that film that was uh, made in 1976. Uh, And it's a a documentary about pottery making in Japan, in the south of Japan. But in the case of the Minge Film Archive, um, I came about this rather, rather slowly in a certain way. I mean, Bernard Leach gave me films that he had made in 1970, in 1934 and 35 in Japan and Korea. Now, it's a story about how this came up, came about, as you can imagine, and it's probably going to be far too long for your listeners. But while I was making my film, Potters at Work, um, or planning it, 
Um, I hope you know that film. It, it, it's, it's a long time ago, but it used to be shown in every single school everywhere in the world um, uh, for students of pottery. Um, Potter said, when I was planning that film, I, was, I read Bernard Leach's A Potter in Japan for a second time. There wasn't that much to read in 1975 about the lives of potters. There, there were lots of books about pottery curation and uh, you know, the arts and crafts of Japan, but there weren't that many books to read about the people who made them. So I read Bernard Leach's book again, and there was a brief, a very brief mention, half a paragraph. When I returned to Mashiko, when I returned to Mashiko, I showed them the films that I had made 20 years earlier, and everybody in the town laughed and enjoyed watching. So I was intrigued by this because I did, who would know that Bernard Leach had made films? So uh, one thing led to another. A film of mine was showing at the London Film Festival, and I made an excuse to go over, go and meet um, Bernard Leach. I had contacted uh, Janet Leach, his wife, and uh, she was very funny and grumpy and very interesting character uh, and very kind. Um, and she said, well, you know, Bernard, you know, he's the clumsiest man I ever met. He had no idea how to use machines. I can't imagine what would be on those films. You know, all the years I've been living with him, I never could teach him to, to, to use a pop-up a toaster. And, you know, whenever he drives through the town of St. Ives, everybody runs for cover. But you're welcome to come and look at the movies, the films, if you want. Now, at that time, in 1975, Bernard Leach was beginning to lose his eyes. He was actually, you know, on the road to uh, almost full blindness. And uh, he I don't remember how old he was at the time precisely, but he was elderly and blind. And he was, of course, thinking about his legacy. So at, wh by the time I get to St. Ives, it's clear that Janet and Bernard had decided to give me these films because uh, I was ready to take them. And I was offering to um, make copies for them and to preserve them. Now, here we are almost, you know, 45 years, 45 years later, and now I know what to do with them. At the time, film technology was such that if you had a film, you could make another copy of the film from the film. But then you only had a copy. So what I did was, now what I'm doing is I'm taking these films and we're transferring them uh, to the best quality uh, data transfers, 2K or 4K transfers, which gives very, very, very high results. And when you have data, uh, there's lots of opportunities to uh, do many things, to restore and to clean and to improve the contrast and adjust the speed slightly in the case that films are running too fast or too slow. Um, and then the most important aspect of this is the ability to record commentaries, which is what I have been doing. Now, the first film in the series uh, was a film that I made uh, with Warren McKenzie, which perhaps you know this film, 19, in 2006, I think, or 2008. I, uh, I had this film uh, about the Leech Pottery, which I call the Leech Pottery 1952, which Janet Leach had given me. And I had put it out on VHS, so there are VHS copies kicking around in certain places. But, of course, there was no sound. Um, so I went to... Uh, when I had... I, I, went, I decided I would release this film and test this case. So I went out and visited Warren and sat with him for a day uh, and recorded his voice as he watched the movie. And then... Uh, and Warren, as you, I'm sure, know or remember, his voice is well known to, to Potters. He was a great talker. He, he spoke very warmly. He spoke very evocatively about his experiences in uh, St. Ives and uh, the importance of Bernard Leach and the ideas of Minge to his own work. And uh, we recorded and we completed a, um, a um, documentary on DVD. And I put that out on DVD with New Warren's voice. Then when I was in St. Ives, I went to St. Ives, and among other things, to show them what I had done when the Leech Pottery reopened in St. Ives, um, whatever number of years ago that was, they reopened and I showed them. And they had just uh, received a box of films 
from the widow of John Anderson, who was the founder of an organization, of a, he was the director of a, a little distribution company that distributed films on pottery making to potters across England, on 16 millimeter mostly. And he had passed away. He had made some films too. He made a film about David Leach. So when, um, the, and a box arrived from the widow, and in the box there was a record, there was a tape marked Bernard Leach film or something like that. I don't know what it's, I don't remember what it said on the tape. I have the box of tape here. So sure, lo and behold, it turns out to be Bernard Leach's narration for that particular film. So what I've now done, what I did was I made an, another DVD version of this, of this, which is called the Leach Pottery 1952 re, revised edition, um, in which you can listen to Bernard speaking or you can listen to Warren speaking. So this is, the reason I'm telling you all this is that um, this is about the flexibility of digital technology. This allows us to have many stories to tell and uh, there are many stories to tell and as many people there are many many people who could tell wonderful stories about pottery making by watching different films so in the Mingay project many of the films have multiple narratives because either somebody talked so long that I had to make two two versions because the material was too interesting to throw out or Two different people or three different people have stories to tell that are equally interesting from different points of view. So, and the last thing I want to say about the digital technology is because every all of the equipment has become so simple to use and so light and so portable. I can go and visit potters on site and sit with them in their environments where they feel happy and comfortable and relaxed and where we can also take images as well, which are, are nice. And the recording equipment doesn't make any noise and the film running doesn't make any noise. We don't have, we don't need a recording booth to, to, to you know, block the, to muffle the sound of a movie projector. So I show them films on um, my laptop and I have my recording device and sometimes I have cameramen with me and sometimes I record with, work with a remote camera and we, we talk about the films and I can stop and start and I can continue, the, I can have the conversations continue for a long time. We can watch the movie. We typically watch the movie at least twice. And so usually I ask the potters, and it's not always potters, by the way, but I usually ask potters if I can find them um, to talk about what they remember from the days when these films are taking place. And also, um, you know, who they remember and whatever. And then based on what they tell me, I ask questions. So the films are done in Japanese, English, and Korean. The Japanese and English I do myself. Um, the Korean I have, an, have some people helping me in Korea, and I have a, an excellent assistant helping me in Canada with editing. So the editing and subtitling is, is, is much, much more labor-intense than the actual recording sessions. But the beauty of the digital technology is the lightness and the ease of being able to set up an interview that's not intimidating, um, I can go into somebody's home or kiln site or pottery studio and I don't need special lights and I don't, I don't have to go in with a crew and intimidate people. I can just, it can feel like a conversation between two interested people. And that's what I hope it does. Yeah, and, and I wanted to describe just one of the films that I watched. You you gave me um, access to some of them, which I really appreciate. That it was a, it was really actually a miraculous experience because I was watching a film from 1925, um, and I'm going to make sure I get the name right. It's in the land of the morning calm, 
which I believe that this is one of the films where there's two versions of the film. Um, I'm list, I'm watching the film um, where a, a master Angi Potter is describing what he's seeing from the early 1900s of what it would be like to be in a rural Korean village making Angi pots, both large jars and you know small um, down to even small soup bowls. Um, but what I found to be so fascinating about it is the way that it's edited. It feels so intimate. And I think one of the things about older film is is that people weren't used to being filmed. So a lot of times you see people that are almost looking at the camera as if the cameraman or woman is foreign, meaning that they're like almost like an alien. Like you could see they, they would stop and they would look at the camera as if it was confusing. But having the narration of a master potter talking about the experience he has watching it it, it pushes through what could be sort of an awkward experience. So can you talk about how you create intimacy between the narrator and the viewer, or me, the potential viewer, through the way you cut the video, like the way you do the edits? Well, uh, there's two aspects to the editing, of course. There's the film and the, and the sound. Okay? So I'm going to talk to you about the film first. Um, there was a film made, this film... Uh, to for your audience, I think it's important for the film to be to, to be understood that this film was made by Benedictine priests who were living in Korea, um, and they they were the major um, Catholic uh, mission to Korea, as I understand it, and they were living in Korea, and they of course, as always, they they were working with rural peasants, and you know they worked. Uh, essentially with many in villages where people were where, where there were a lot of poor people and they made a film called In the Land of the Morning Calm in 1925 and Norbert Weber who was the abbot of the um, of the church in in Germany I guess and I don't his position in I, I think he was the head he was a very talented photographer and author and also a filmmaker now how he became I don't think he made any other films but the Benedictines had the budget to make this film. He decided in, in 1915 or 16 to make a film, went back to um, Germany and France to get training. And I understand that he, ran the, he, he made the film, in fact, himself. Now, those days, it was only 35 millimeters, so it was very heavy, and the camera was operated by hand. It was cranked by hand. So if you have... If you're curious about the speed, the speed's pretty good, and we tried our best to adjust it to the extent that we could, but it's hand-cranked, so that means that the speed is not 100% um, accurate the way it would be if there was a motor attached. These were the days before there were motors on movie cameras. So um, then the film was uh, released in Germany, and it was called In the Land of the Morning Calm. It included three minutes of Angi pottery making and a lot of other crafts and a lot of other aspects of Korean society as well. Um, I have very close connections with the Korean Film Archive because I had been there many times to uh, to um, acquire and research about film materials about Korean ceramics, which didn't exist, and I became friendly with them. And one day they, they told me... the one of the archivists told me that they had actually found all of the outtakes, four hours of unused, unseen film footage from 1925 in a church basement, in the church basement of the St. Ottilian Abbey of the Benedictine um, sect in um, Germany. And the Korean government, realizing this was exceedingly important material to Korean history, uh, paid the cost, or the Korean Film Archive paid the cost of tra of um, transferring the film footage to 4K or 2K. Uh, there were about four hours of them of the material, so I was given all of it. And the reason I was given all of it was that they're very generous, and also. I as in a lot of cases, part of the reason that I have everything that I have is that I may have been the only person who showed interest. <laughs> so <laughs> since I'm the only person who showed interest, people were happy that there was somebody interested, so therefore they would give me things. But uh, So what I decided to do was uh, 
to, I examined all the footage, all four hours very carefully, and I pulled from it all of the sequences, uh, all of the short edits and bits where people are making pottery, firing pottery, using pottery, or selling pottery. So the film has been constructed in that manner, as, you, as you'll remember. Uh, the logical sequence of pottery making, beginning with the making and then the glazing and then the firing and stoking and firing, loading, stoking and firing, then the carrying of the pots out of the kiln. Then it goes on to sequences where the pots are in use, showing women carrying pots with water on their heads, showing pots being carried in through villages, showing people eating with pots in the fields. And then finally, a market sequence where we see pots um, being sold and also used. So the, I, the film footage itself is about 18 minutes long. And then uh, it was, you know, being silent, I had to think of what kind of story could I tell here? Uh, and I thought of different ways. Since it's 1925, I didn't daydream about finding anybody who could really talk about it. Uh, in a, in a, you know, from, from the point of view of having, having been there, certainly. But uh, luckily, uh, I, I've been working with a, um, a, a very fine anthropologist at the Smithsonian. He's retired now. His name is Robert Sayers. And Robert Sayers is, has a strong, long-term, passionate interest in... Uh, in the Ongi Potters, and his wife is Korean, and she happened to be in Korea at the time, and luckily for me, she knew Mr. Bay, Mr. Bay um, Yosep, who is also a Catholic. The, many of the Korean Potters, Ongi Potters, are Catholic, as you see, and as, the, as you will also see in the second version of the film, because it talks about the connection between uh, Ongi and the the history of the Catholic Church and and Catholic potters in Korea. So her um, uh, Robert Sayers' um, wife, whose name is Kim Sung Ja, is also exceedingly interested in the crafts of Korea, and she called Mr. Bay and talked to him about this. Now, the how to describe the intimate connection is something more complicated. To be honest. That Mr. Bay was in the hospital, um, not because he was ill, but he has diabetes, and I think he, his wife is quite elderly and has a little bit of dementia, I think, and I don't think there was anybody to really take care of him, so he was living in what they call a hospital or, you know, in a home of some kind. So she, we actually didn't tell him we were going to interview him, um, and that was not my choice. That was the choice of uh, Kim Sung Ja. We, she just told him, you know, she made up this story about the, this this very famous filmmaker from Canada who wanted to meet him. So I po I posed as this fa famous filmmaker from Canada, and uh, I um, was uh, honored to meet him. And but I think. I'm not sure if he, I think he understood, he saw that we were filmed, we, we were recording him, but I think once he started watching the movie, he was so gobsmacked, he was so fascinated that all of the hesitation, if there was any hesitation, disappeared. And um, I found over the years when interviewing people that uh, there's a lot of people who don't particularly like talking about themselves. But most people like talking about topics of mutual interest. So I didn't go to interview Mr. Bay, although he would, be a, he would be a fantastic story. I went to ask him to help me to tell me what we were looking at. You know, what are we really looking at here? And of course, I'm, a, I'm also a trained potter. I, I have a history of pottery as well. And, but... And I know exactly what we're looking at, <laughs> but I want him to tell me in his voice what he remembers, what we're looking at, um, what's special about it. And I gave him little reminders through the interpreter saying, make sure that you understand that this is for, for your great-grandchildren, for people who will never see you working. 
what would you like to tell them about this process? Because we can't see people doing this anymore. We can, people, we can see people demonstrating, but that's very different. So, um, and I think I'm quite successful in creating um, a certain intimacy with the uh, interviewees in all of these cases, just because um, it's not about me and it's not about them. It's about the subject. And they know that I'm very interested and that I'm reasonably well informed. So, um, yeah, I think that all of the interviewees react differently, but uh, I'm very, I'm very, very, very happy with this particular one. And I believe that there would be nobody in Korea who could speak quite that way about something that happened you know, 95 years ago. It makes me think about time. You know, like the original film is, is from 25, or at least that's when it was finished. So it was probably started, you know, before that. Um, then in, in our time, you're talking to a man who has not quite as old as that film, but he, you know, he, he could understand the experience and was talking about it, but then I'm watching it years later in 2020. So it's interesting how time plays a role in all of this. And you're really giving us an intimate look into what life was like then. Like one of the, my favorite things about the film beyond the kiln, I loved seeing that kiln firing, (laughs) um, was the children there were children in the film a ton and it, it 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 did it helped me to realize that in these villages where people were making there's not a big distinction between work life and home life and you saw in the markets you saw children walking around you would see 8 or 10 year old kids carrying 2 and 3 year old kids on their back right beside a huge what similar to an anagama kiln in full flame, <laughs> like full fire, and these kids are just walking around. So that was a part of the story that I don't think I would have fully understood unless I saw a film, you know, because I can read about that era of Korean uh, ceramics, but to see the film, to see the children, to see um, the workers, the interaction between who were like the foreman of the firing versus the kind of lower down the pole guys that were doing kind of more of the grunt work, like those things, when you see a film, it, it helped me emotionally connect to it in a really different way. Well, um, the separations that we experience in contemporary life between work and hobbies, between work and, you know, between what we like to do, what we don't like to do, between careers and passions and careers and, and hobbies and work life and home life, those didn't exist. And these potters existed. They made pots for people to use because they're because people needed them. And these kinds of stories came out come out very very clear clearly in all of these films, and particularly the films about Onda and films about Mashiko in um, Onda in southern Japan and Mashiko in uh, north of Tokyo, which is in Tochigi Prefecture, the famous village that Hamada uh, Shoji made so famous. Um, there, there wasn't a difference, and they farmed because they had to eat, and they made pots because they needed something to trade or sell. In a lot of these cases, there were there was no money involved. They would just barter, so they would take a pot to the local town and swap it for rice or swap. These were these potters did not own land. Being Catholic and being in remote environments, they did not own land. They were they parked themselves on. Um, they were working on land that was owned by landowners. Those kinds of story, that kind of story will come out in version two. If I've sent you that, I don't remember. Um, so uh, the separation that we now inevitably live with between um, the work that we do to survive and the work that we would like to do <laughs> didn't really uh, exist. And this is to some extent why I call this the Minge Film Archive. This is about... Um, the people who made wonderful works of art and craft without necessarily thinking that they were making wonderful works of art and craft. They were making things that were necessary to the lives that, that of their own lives and to the lives of the people around them. 
one of the things I wanted to have your opinion on is how Minge has evolved over time. So with this film archive, we're looking backwards, you know, into the 20s. Uh, I think the earliest film is, is that film, right? That's 25. correct. The, the 1925, the Minge film archive uh, consists of over 50 hours of films from 1925 to 1976. And when I say film archive, I want to be very clear that I'm only talking about film, meaning 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, 8 millimeter films that are in fragile condition and re- need uh, restoration and need rescue. Um, I'm not talking about videotape, videos that came later. So uh, this is very early for sure. Yeah. So when we think about that, that time period, um, uh, 20s to the 70s, you know, my, my first introduction to Minge was through books. You know, it was not, not through films. Um, and it was in the early 90s when I was in, or late 90s when I was in undergraduate. Um, I started to read uh, Yanagi's book, you know, which is, um, you know, quite, quite a famous book in and of itself for pottery lovers, but also to explain what Minge is. So before we go on, can you talk a little bit about putting Minge in context and specifically about uh, Yanagi's writings about um, uh, sort of the notions of beauty? Just to re- respond first to one thing you said, which I think is very important. What I'm trying to do here is, you know, we had all these great people talking about Minge and the idea of the, their ideas of, what, of meaning in folk craft. What I have, luckily, is moving picture records of what they were looking at. So I have films by Bernard Leach when they were developing the Minge ethos, when they were thinking about how to explain what they were thinking with the word Minge, with the concept of Minge, they were looking at a certain craft practice in villages by traditional craftspeople. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm the only one who has those records in moving image form. Yeah. Because of, How fortunate. That's yeah, amazing. I mean, I, I, it, it was fortunate. And it's it sort of, looking back, it's good timing because everything at the Leech Pottery really got lost. You know, not everything, but most things got lost. And I actually sent them copies back of the films that I had made for Con- uh, Bernard Leach, and they all got lost. So I've been keeping everything here in my basement in Toronto. So you asked me a little bit about Minge. The, the idea of Minge is, Ming is people and gay is art, it, the art of the people. Um, it's a little different nuance from our world of folk crafts, our idea about folk crafts. Uh, the key person behind the Minge movement was uh, Yanagi Soetsu, Soetsu Yanagi, who um, who's known in the West, particularly through the writings of Bernard Leach and also from the book, the, book the Unknown Craftsman, which was, it's, it says it was translated by Bernard Leach, but it actually wasn't because Bernard Leach didn't read Japanese, but that's a whole other story. Um, Yanagi's idea was mixed with religious thinking. He felt strongly that the most beautiful objects the most beautiful objects that we experience in our, in our world everywhere, uh, not just in Japan, but everywhere, are those objects that are made for human usage by human beings who understand what people need in their lives. What, and because they're making things from local materials, uh, inevitably local materials because they couldn't get anything anywhere else, they couldn't get anything else, People are using local materials. Uh, the potter goes to the mountain, digs, you know, digs the clay from the mountain and uses the clay as it is because that's what's there and develops a very deep knowledge of the materials that are at hand through constant practice. And because these objects are made in multiples, because that's the only economic way to make them, um, the craftspeople became rem- become remarkably, remarkably skilled. And at the same time, because it's a business, the skills are forgotten at a certain level. You become so skilled that it no longer matters. 
you're making things over and over and over again, repeating repeat work that is made to to fill a certain need. And I won't say it's made mindlessly, it's made skillfully, but at a level below the operation of consciousness. So there's an understanding, and that's where the idea of the unknown craftsman comes in. And the word unknown is complicated here because it's not that the craftsman isn't known, it's that the craftsman is kind of unknowing and anonymous at the same time. So they believed that the, 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 the world of modern art inevitably is about the ego and the, you know, and the need for self-presentation that modern artists have. All of us have it. But rural craftspeople created works of sublime beauty uh, without such planning and without such intent. And Yanagi and the Minge people understood and believed that the works made by uh, individual crafts, by, by craft communities, um, without any thought to creating anything other than the thing itself. You know, they weren't creating, they were making pots, they weren't making careers. So... The Minge idea had a big impact, I think, on on uh, Western people, particularly in the '70s when these books started to be circulated. In the '60s and '70s in America and everywhere, partly because there wasn't much to read about, as I said earlier, there wasn't too much to read in that period about the about being a potter. There was a lot to read about pots and about from a museum perspective or, or a historical perspective, but there wasn't that much to read about. You know, what, 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 what would it be like to be a potter and why? And why? Like, you know, not only, the, not only the, what it is to be a potter, but why be a potter? And Leach, Leach's writings and then later Yanagi's writings uh, inspired a lot of people. Can you talk about the relationship between uh, Hamada and Leach as makers and then Yanagi as being a philosopher and writer? Because that's something that it's easy to say, like, There was three, and actually it was more than the three of them, but, you know, there was a group of people living and working, and one is a writer and two are makers. But that really doesn't describe the intellectual back and forth of that social dynamic that they had. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that became what we know as the Minge philosophy? Well, the... the That's an interesting question. You know, a lot of people get stuck with this conundrum of, they call themselves Minge potters, but, you know, they were famous and sold their pots for high prices, and this seems to be a contradiction to other people. These were these were modern people, modern 20th century people who had, who were, who came from different degrees of wealth, who were highly, highly educated, and who were not village craftspeople and never considered themselves to be village craftspeople. But they were united in admiring the crafts and realizing that they had a great deal to learn from the crafts. They were all highly intellectual, and they all wrote, which is something that is um, not well known. Like Hamada also wrote. He wrote essays. Um, And he didn't write books, but he wrote essays. But Yanagi also, by the way, never wrote books. He wrote only essays. The Unknown Craftsman is not based on a book in, from Japan, it is in Japanese. It's based on essays. And now the interaction was interesting. I think that um, Yanagi was very. Um, he Yanagi was the leader philosophically, for sure. Um, there was also Kawai Kanjiro, Kawai Kanjiro, who was also a very very intelligent man and a very erudite man. And Kawai also was very much an intellectual. But they chose to, in their own ways, to um, become artists who were deeply immersed in, if I may say so, gratitude to the past. So Leach, in his way, went to St. Ives, 
an odd place to go. There was no clay. There was no wood. Right. Um, but he went for reasons. He was invited to go, and he founded a, the, the leech pottery and continued in his own way to create uh, works that um, respected the past. Yanagi kept writing and collecting. He was never a maker, but he was a very charismatic man, and he had a lot of he had followers all over who um, followed his lectures and traveled with him when he was collecting. And um, very inspiring. He founded the Japan Folkcraft Museum, as you know, and stayed there till the end of his life. And um, Hamada elected to go to Mashiko, but and st and stay there for the rest of his life. And he created a remarkable facility, which is uh, along the lines of a traditional folkcraft environment. But certainly, it was all. A about the making of Hamada pots. It wasn't, uh, there was no sense that these people were trying to pretend that they were unknown craftsmen in the, uh, in the, in the mold that's described in the unknown craftsmen. Um, Hamada, and at the same time, they traveled and lectured and demonstrated. They, they traveled all over the world. I mean, Hamada went, demonstrated in France and Spain and the United States and New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and, you know, so a leech demonstrated in multiple countries as well. So uh, they were interested in spreading their idea of what the future of crafts should be. When I think about these gentlemen, I think about them as, as older men. And that's largely um, from Susan Peterson's book. Um, you know, you, you see these images. Uh, I'm trying to think of how old Hamana would have been at that point. He would... I would imagine he would have been in his 60s or 70s. I, I, I don't remember the dates of that, but I think it's, he was in his 70s. I mean, that book was after The Unknown Craftsman, which was in 74. So um, Susan Peterson's book. And Susan Peterson also, also, also made a film, too. I don't know if you're aware of that. So, um, yes, they, well, they weren't always old. <laughs> Well, that's what I was going to say, and that that was my question, is that one of the things that film does is that it allows you to see people alive. Like you see, when you see people walking around in their 30s, they walk differently than Hamada did in his 70s. And film is is wonderful for that thing, you know, that it can give you a, a literal snapshot of someone's life at a certain time. So when you think about the archive as a whole, you're seeing films from, you know, a 50-year or more period. Minge changed over time as more and more people talked about it. So in the beginning, it was that circle of friends discussing this philosophy, but now Minge is recognized worldwide as a philosophy about folk craft and really about life and, and beauty. So can you talk about how these films help to spread Minge to the world so that people can really get a glimpse of what, what these folks' lives were like when they were young, when they were old, you know, throughout the, the evolution of the philosophy? Well, I, I'll tell you, you probably have seen this. You may have seen this in some of the films. I, I, when I'm interviewing people, I rarely mention Minge because I want to go into this, you know, underground. I want to be able to go under the consciousness of what is it all about. So when I meet a potter and I show him a movie, I want to know what are they doing and why are they doing it that way? And how did those, you know, and then that leads, of course, to how did that, those techniques occur and what was the reason for using this technique this technique in that way and making this thing in that way, et cetera, et cetera. And then I leave the idea of what this all means to other people, the viewer. I don't think that this is not a testament to Minge, or if it is a testament to Minge, that's a decision that the viewer has to make. What I'm interested in is showing uh, and elucidating the way things were for the artists and craftsmen of the world. And uh, we can't go further back because there were no films further back. There no, you know, the movie cameras were only invented, of course, and certainly not available for people to carry with them until the 1920s. So 
Um, I call it the Minge Film Archive to give this my project, the Minge Film Archive, to give people a, a little bit of a window and a frame work for which to understand what they're going to be seeing. But we rarely talk in the films about what is Minge, um, because after watching it, it shouldn't be necessary. What a beautiful sentiment that is. In certain, you know, and also I, uh, I want to be fair to, to the people that I'm talking to. They're not intellectuals necessarily. I mean, a, a lot of the, the people I'm talking to are bright. They're, they could be very, very bright, but they're not necessarily intellectuals. And the conceptualizing about things is not the purpose of this. This is the moving, this is moving images. It, the experience should be immersive. What was life like for people? What did it sound like? What did it look like? You know, how did people move? What did they wear? What did they eat? You know, what was work like for, for people? So one of the films that I'm exceptionally pleased with is the film about Mashiko in 1937, where the grandson of the people, the grandson and the great-grandson of the people, the same man who is the son, the grandson and the and the great-grandson of people in the film um, talks about his family and how they lived during that period when that film was being made and what they were doing and how it connected to their lives. And I don't think we have to talk about Minge. What's the point? I, I noticed um, on the website you talk about the influence of D.T. Suzuki, who was really one of the most famous writers about Zen Buddhism in the West. And I, I wondered if you, or I wondered if you could give some context about the influence of Buddhism on the sort of philosophy of Minge, because I know I've heard people talk about connections, but I've never heard someone talk about D.T. Suzuki specifically, like how he played into the bigger whole there. Well, D.T. Suzuki was um, first of all he was Yanagi, uh, so it's Yanagi's teacher. Uh, high school teacher, an English teacher. He was old, much older. Um, and at Gakushuin, which is called in English the Pierce School in Tokyo, which is a school for very elite um, kids. And uh, Yanagi met many of the people who, who, with whom he f formed lifelong friendships. Um, D.T. Suzuki was the English teacher there at a certain point. I don't think he stayed very long. Daisa Suzuki is more known, I would say, in the West than he is in Japan because the vast majority of his writings are in English. Um, his unique career would be a whole other story. But, um, and there are, there are some materials about D.T. Suzuki that, and his impact on the international arts and letters you know, that are exceedingly important and interesting. D.T. Suzuki was um, Yanagi's teacher, as I said. At that particular period, Yanagi was moving into a group called the Shirakaba Group. It was a Shirakaba Literary Society, it was called, which was a group of young intellectuals who were very passionately interested in the arts of the West as they were developing at that period. And there were authors, Shiga Naoya, Satomi Ton, um, and many, mostly literary people in this group. And they were focusing on introducing the arts of the West to Japan in the 1920s and the teens. Uh, Suzuki, Suzuki was already in America at this particular point, I believe. I don't know the dates exactly. I can't be sure about the dates exactly right at the moment, but um, and they were the Shirakaba group introduced Rodin and and, and um, Renoir, and they introduced uh, Cezanne, and they introduced the literary works of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and they were very important in introducing international works. In, the, in, the, in this process, earlier on, uh, Yanagi became passionately interested in William Blake and the poetry of William Blake. Um, so, And through this, you know, the trajectory of his intellectual pursuits was mostly international. But in the 20s, in the late teens, I believe, 
um, he was approached by a Jap- a Jap- Japanese brothers named the Asakawas who lived in Asakawa Noritaka and Asakawa Takumi who lived in Korea and who were passionately interested in the arts and crafts and culture of Korea. And when they heard that there was going to be an exhibition of Rodin in Tokyo, they went to to um, Tokyo to see the exhibition. And they met Yanagi, and they took him a Korean pot and insisted to him that it was very important for Yanagi as, an, as, an, as a Japanese intellectual to learn about Korea. So he went to Korea, and it was through his encounters with Korea that he realized the importance of the daily arts and crafts of the people. And that's kind of what leads us to the Minge idea. Now, that doesn't bring Suzuki into it exactly, but the story with Suzuki is that um, Daisat Suzuki, in, towards the end of his life, um, or, well, after the war, uh, moved to Kamakura, Kita Kamakura, northern North Kamakura, where he founded his library with the help of various sponsors. His library was called the Matsugaoka Bunko, Matsugaoka Bunko. And the Matsugaoka Bunko still exists, and that was his library where he worked and studied and remained until the end of his life. Uh, he died in 90, at 96. Because he was... He respected Yanagi very much and saw Yanagi as a possible successor. So he asked Yanagi to become the his successor as head of the Matsugaoka Bunko. We call it also the Matsugaoka Library. So he asked Yanagi to, to, to be his successor. But Yanagi, unfortunately, had a stroke when he was in his late 60s. And... Um, went to Suzuki in a very famous moment and apologized for not being able to, being up to the task of carrying on and taking over the library. Uh, Suzuki himself lived to the age of 96. So that, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunately, one, one would have expected that uh, Yanagi would have lived longer and he would have been able to continue, but he didn't. So... There was a great deal of mutual respect. Uh, one of the p- projects I have here is I am I have completed interviews with uh, Daisat Suzuki's um, personal secretary Mihoko Okamura, who is a very very close friend of mine, and she talks extensively about the respect that those two men had for each other. Uh, according to Mihoko, Daisat Suzuki never talked to her about crafts. But as you know, he, his very famous book, Zen and, and Japanese Culture, uh, does cover many of the arts of Japan in a similar, in a way. And I think he left it to Yanagi to elucidate and to find the connections between Buddhist thinking and, um, craft making. And re- he respected, we understand that he respected Yanagi very much. And when Yanagi died, Suzuki delivered the key eulogy in which he referred to uh, Yanagi as Binohomon. Binohomon means the gate of beauty. So that that is named after one of, one of Yanagi's most important essays, or probably the most important essay by Yanagi, is called, now translated as the Dharma Gate of Beauty. According to Daisat Suzuki, Yanagi himself was a gate to understanding beauty. And one of the things I found interesting about the um, the influence of Buddhism in, in Japan, um, my, my interaction with Japan is very limited, I should say. <laughs> I've only been once, um, I've been to Mashiko, I've been um, around Tokyo a bit. Um, so I would say I have a peripheral understanding. But through reading and through practicing Zen Buddhism myself, one thing that I notice is that Zen is interwoven into Japanese society um, in a different way than we think about religion here. 
you know? So I often find that people would reference Buddhism even if they didn't necessarily think of themselves as being active Buddhists in the same way that you might reference Christian philosophy without actively going to church all the time. And I remember thinking about, um, I was reading about Hamada at one point in his life that he had, um, you know, taken up meditation. I think this was in his, like, early years, like 12 or 13, um, and it was a part of sort of a Buddhist training that the children um, in his area went through with meditation. But then after that, from my understanding, he stopped, and his his main practice, or, or what could be seen as a practice um, of Buddhism was not about the religion. It was about making pots. You know, m- making the art was the spiritual practice. So can you talk a little bit about your perception of Hamada's sense of spirituality? You know, they would say that it's all together and there's no separation between what we do and what we are. So when you talk about spirituality, you we're talking about something outside of ourselves and Western people tend to think of religion as being something that's practiced at times and not at other times so then you have religious practice which is separated from the lives that you have during the week which are devoted to daily activities and necessities I would say that I can't speak for Hamada because he would speak very well for himself if he could. And he, I have an extensive and wonderful interview with him in English that I've reconstructed from outtakes. He would say it's not different. There's nothing different between making things and meditating. And Daisetsu Suzuki was revolutionary in this way as well. I'm, I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a scholar of Buddhism, but certain people were skeptical about him because he didn't have all of the training that Buddhist priests and Buddhists have. But his revolution was to look behind the practice to the meaning. And I would say that most Japanese people, Japanese people live in a Buddhist environment and because they live immersed in a Buddhist environment, they don't need to say this is a Buddhist environment. So, and I wouldn't like to say, it sounds too romantic to say that that Hamada's spiritual practice was making pots. I don't think there's any need to think about it that way. Hamada's work was making pots. And to the extent to which he devoted his life to it and created uh, beauty and set himself as an example for good, honest work. Isn't that enough? (laughs) It is. (laughs) It was interesting when I went to his house uh, to see the physical layout of the studio and and the home and and all of that and to think about... um, you know, a, a living, breathing man that that went through all the same things that we all go through. You know, it, it was really, as much as it's a museum to him, it also really humanized him for me. Because, you know, at one point in my life, he was like the King Potter that I looked to the most. And actually, after going to his home, I realized that he was more man than anything else. You know, and it was, it was, uh, it was a great experience. It, it allowed me to see both the pots in a different way and to see the person in a different way. Well, he was a man also of great appetites. You know, he had kids and he had grandchildren and he had a farm and he traveled extensively. He collected things from all over the world. He had a great passion for certain Windsor chairs and shaker chairs and crafts of all kinds. He was passionately interested in visiting places and eating whatever anybody served him. He was totally without uh, pretense, I think, in lots of ways. But at the same time, he was a man who knew who he was, and he was treated with respect everywhere he went. And you also made a a point that they were already in their 60s by the time they became internationally well-known, and that was because of the war. 
Um, you know, the earliest film that we have of, of Hamada is 1934, where he was a young man. But that between the 1930s and the 1950s, nobody could leave, the Japanese couldn't leave Japan. Um, and there were currency restrictions and there were passport restrictions. So when he went to uh, Scripps College in the 1950s, he, it, it was quite a uh, process, apparently, uh, to deal with the Japanese bureaucracy, Japanese immigration authority, authorities to allow him to leave um, leave Japan for a period of time to uh, demonstrate in America. So, um, but, so you're right. By the time they went to Black Mountain College and Leach went to Alfred University and they went to California, they were already people, you know, in their 60s. So they'd established themselves in certain respects, uh, you know, the way, the, the way their lives and their art was going to be. So with a project like this, it's, it's really broad scope. You, you've spent so much time and labor, you know, putting these films together, editing, making connections. You know, you're making connections to people that can kind of redefine what these films are. But this all takes money. It takes time. It takes support. So can you talk about how you've enlisted the financial help of other institutions, but also how you've um, used networks of people to help to fund this project as a whole? Well, it's been, you know, like fundraising of all, uh, uh, for any project, it's, it's a struggle, but it's a combination of, um, uh, we have uh, the Japanese Folk Craft, the Folk Craft Museum of Japan, the Folk Craft Association of Japan is a nominal sponsor and they seek funding for me in Japan for the project in Japan through foundations and the money goes to them and then it comes to me for the actual production work. The Leech Pottery in England is also a sponsor. They don't have money, of course, but they have tax status and they're, they're able to uh, receive money on my behalf. If I find a sponsor in England, then the money goes to the Leech Pottery at first. In, in Canada and the United States, the University of uh, Toronto, the Centre for Archaeology at the University of Toronto, um, is a sponsor of the project and they seek funds. So individual sponsors can make, um, individual donors can make donations to this project uh, by donating to the University of Toronto Centre for Archaeology which then in turn passes this on for, for um, the production, to, to support the production. At the same time, we also have exhibitions, and when we have exhibitions, then I, we, I charge screening fees. So we're having a major exhibition now in Korea. Uh, this is the second exhibition in Korea in the, in the last year, and we've been paid very generously for the for permissions to show the films for these period for this period we're planning new exhibitions in uh when things open up again we have some exhibitions planned in europe and uh i charge fees for the screening rights and we're beginning now to to uh offer these films to uh universities on a screening fee basis uh, but the long-term plan is to have a digital database, which will be searchable and cross-searchable. So you'll be able to find, you'll be able to look in all the films to find the information that you want. So you and I are only talking about one film so far today. But if you want to find correspondences between what interested you in the Ongi film to what goes on in Mashiko, what goes on in, in Leech Pottery, and what goes on in in Onda and what goes on in Okinawa, you'll be able to do that. And for that, I'm looking for institutional support from an, a museum or a library uh, that would be interested in taking this digital database over and uh, keeping it online indefinitely if possible. In the beginning, when you first got those films from Leach in the 70s, did you imagine that this project would become this? Well, no one could possibly have imagined it because it's it's actually, you know, film is a craft as well in the same way that pottery is a craft at a certain level. You have to be able to work with the technologies that you have available at any particular, on hand at any particular time. In 1975, I didn't have any of the technologies. Nobody had the technologies that I've got today. So I have, I mean, I have the know-how, uh, hopefully as well, but... I have the tools now 
that I didn't have then. And in 1975, I couldn't imagine digital tools. I wish I could have. It's amazing to watch the clarity of the films. You know, like we you've mentioned that you can take a 35 or 16 millimeter and get it to 2K or 4K. But what that translates to the human eye is a level of detail that just wasn't even possible in the original film, which is interesting to me. Like in some ways, once this enters the digital realm, it takes on a new life because you can increase the contrast here. You can make things clearer than what they actually were in the original films. So how do you determine that? Like how do you determine, uh, do you always take each film to its, um, I don't want to say cleanest, but you know, to the standard of what we expect 4K to be now? Uh, the answer to that is no. It, so, it depends on the condition of the film itself. Like what we do is we, you know, broken splices we try to repair just, just because it's just irritating to watch films jump in the, you know, in the gate and tape splices, we, we you know, we'll patch those frames digitally. And uh, we do a little bit of scratch removal, but... These are old films, and they should look, I believe they should look like they're from their own period. Um, also, there's the matter of speed. Uh, the films were made in di- different kinds of cameras, were, were ran at different speeds because of different, because they were different kinds of cameras. One, for example, as I mentioned earlier, with the Land of the Morning Calm, it was a hand-cranked camera. Bernard Leach ran... Uh, Bernard Leach's films were 16 millimeter, and they were made on a Bell and Howell camera, which had a, was run by a spring. So the spring, the speed of this, of the running of the film through the camera with a, with a, with the spring is not 100 percent accurate either, because as the spring runs down, it's not quite the same speed as it was when it started up. So there are certain things that we do correct, but uh, I like the idea that old films look old. It doesn't, you know, as long as they're nice and clean and sharp and comprehensible. But we remove the we remove the worst looking parts for sure. Yes. Um, to wrap up the interview, I wanted to talk about. You mentioned that there's an exhibition right now um, in Korea, and I think it went up for the uh, Korean Biennial. Right. Yeah, it's the Korean Ceramic Biennale. Yes. Can you talk about how you put films in context with objects? Because I saw some images of the show um, with the films interspersed, and it's a it's a trick. It's not as easy as it sounds to put objects beside film. So, can you talk about part of the exhibition development with this project? Yeah, I can tell. I can tell you that very simply. I didn't do it. (laughs) Uh, I made the films and the. The Korean um, curators at the Korean Ceramic Biennale, the Korean uh, Ceramic Foundation, um, it's quite a large institution and they have many people working and they have their own collections. And they, I believe, four rooms, it looks to me, I haven't been there because I can't go right now, but it looks to me that like they've given four rooms to this project. They also interviewed me. There's a video of me being interviewed there, which I have not yet seen. Uh, but the the setup and the installation is entirely them. I didn't do it. That's uh, that's the easiest way to deal with it. <laughs> well, I was I'm excited and impressed. Uh, the only thing that does isn't clear to me, uh, except for one case of the uh, uh, the working processes of the Korean folk potter, which is showing in one of the rooms, is it's not entirely clear to me where people are going to be able to sit and watch the movies. Um, I don't particularly like the idea of the movies being shown as wallpaper, as just background to objects. I'd like to be sure that people will have an opportunity, if they wish to do so, to sit down and absorb and watch the films from beginning to end and absorb the narratives. And and it's not entirely clear to me how they've done that. But so far, I think the exhibition setup has been wonderful. But you know, we've done many different different projects like I'm, I'm now engaged with the National Museum of Catalonia in Barcelona that is planning an exhibition about Hamada and uh, Artigas and Miró, Juan Miró in uh, the Catalonian artists whom 
uh, Hamada knew, and they, they exchanged gifts, and they knew each other. And uh, what I've proposed to them is that I provide a film clip to show how every one of the pots in their collection was made. You know, how Hamada threw those bowls and how Hamada decorated them. And I have film footage of, of all of that, of all those processes. There's lots more to come. So to wrap up, can you leave the website so that people can become more familiar with the project? Well, the website, the website for this project is the Minge Film Archive. If you search Minge Film Archive, um, you will find it. It's uh, under my other, uh, it's con- contained in the website for my own film project, my own film company, Marty Gross Films. But if you, if you Google the um, Minge Film Archive, you will certainly find it. And on that site, you'll be able to find much more information about what the plans are, uh, some of the information, of course, is outdated because it's almost impossible to keep these things up. But uh, there's some film samples. There's a short film uh, showing me doing film restoration work. And there's a short film sample of some of the films from Mashiko and other places. And um, there is a button for donations. So, and if you want to know more, and for academics, people at universities or in cl- clubs or whatever, if I'm approached to show particular films for particular occasions, then we can usually make some arrangements to do that. There are uh, close to 50 films completed now. Well, thanks for taking the time to do this interview. As one archivist to another, I want to thank you also for just doing the work, because I know there's a lot of solitary work that goes into making the films that I've been able to see. So thanks for doing that as well. Well, it's fun. You know, if I didn't have, <clears throat> if, if it wasn't fun to do this, I, I wouldn't be doing it. It keeps, it, 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 and it continues to be fun. There's lots to discover and there's lots of great stories to, to hear and lots of great stories to be told. I'd like to thank Marty for taking the time to do this interview. It was a pleasure to chat with him and to hear more about the archive. If you'd like to see examples of the films we talked about on today's show, you can do that at mingayfilm.martygrossfilms.com. Before we go, I wanted to thank the folks that have been shopping my holiday sale. It's always a pleasure to ship out pots to new homes. That sale will be up through the beginning of the year, but If you want to have your pots arrive before the Christmas holiday, I recommend you get your order in this week. To see the pots that are available for that sale and to make a purchase, you can go to carterpottery.com slash shop. Also wanted to thank the folks that have been supporting our fall fun drive. We're about to the midway point of that, and so if you're feeling generous, I would love your support to help this show keep going. There's two ways to donate. You can go to talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. That's for one-time donations through PayPal. You can also make a monthly pledge at patreon.com slash redclayrambler. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support.